How y'all doing today? Wow, I didn't even have to go for seconds on that one. That's awesome. And it's after lunch. I appreciate that. That means we're caffeinated. I'm happy. Well, folks, my name is Glenn Renfro. I am a developer at uh, VMware. That means, uh, what do I work on? I am a contributor and a collaborator, or sorry, committer and a collaborator on Spring Cloud Dataflow, Spring Batch, Spring Cloud Task, uh, any kind of where, wherever they need me. Um, but at the same time, I'm on the board of directors of AJUG, and which means we're also on the board of directors of DevNexus. So, Roy. Uh, I'm also an engineer at VMware, and I work on different spring projects from, from Glenn. Uh, work on some of our um, products that we uh, sell for our Pivotal platform, um, and also some open source projects around Open Service Broker, and uh, we have a, a project called App Broker to help deploy uh, uh, brokers to cloud platforms like Kubernetes and, and Cloud Foundry. So uh, before we go too much further, uh, remember if you are interested in any of the uh, applications that you're gonna see deployed here, um, they are all a part of the project up here. And so feel free, this is in my personal repo, CPPWFS. Uh, jump in, take a look at them, pull them down, so don't have to worry about um, doing much copying. Just hop onto the present, uh, uh, to the uh, project, and I'll be uploading the uh, presentation to that project as well, so. All right. So what we'll be talking about today is we're going to talk about the inspiration. Where did we come up with this Spring Bananas talk? Then we're going to be talking about what is edge computing for those that have not had a chance to be introduced to it. So we're going to go ahead and give a one-on-one on that. We're going to talk about the topology of the base project. So we're going to talk about the IoT, the edge devices that are created with Roy, as well as we're going to um, then roll in to one of the more important parts is, okay, I've got these devices out here. How can I move and create streams or create the streams for the old devices, for the new edge devices, especially as we begin that uh, migration over? And then what we're also going to talk about is how we can dynamically adjust the streams so that we can get the most content and most value out of it. Then we're going to be talking about how we can process data from the edge. So in this case, another thing that we're going to try to cover is, okay, we've got this data, we've stored it, what do we do with it? Is there, you know, is there things that we can do with it? And how can things like a Spring Cloud Data Flow, Spring Batch, or what we're going to call Compose Tasks help us with that? And then we're going to finally close out what, how are we going to evolve this talk? And we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. The other thing that we're going to talk about is a quick note. We're going to be talking about radiation today. And by no means am I offering any medical survival uh, advice, nor are you to take home and say, my gosh, we're gonna, we've learned how to uh, uh, take a, a pack of bananas and find out the radiation readings from them. No, that is just a way for me to get free data from the air that we breathe. And right? it, if you're a nuclear engineer, feel free to tell us if we're wrong about something. That Absolutely. Is not our uh, ex expertise. <laughs> so. Okay. So where did I come up with the spring bananas concept? Well, there was a uh, YouTube video I came across. If you ask my daughter here, you'll know that I have no life outside of taking care and enjoy time with my family, kayaking, fishing, geeking out, and watching documentaries. And there was one that uh, Dr. Derek, Derek Muller put together on a YouTube video that said, you know, I'm gonna show you Oh, you know, radiation from different parts of the world, but instead of spending time to tell you whether it's rims or sieverts, um, sieverts meaning how much damage a body gets, I'm going to use bananas. So if you ever get a chance, this is a wonderful special he put together for PBS. Bananas are mildly radioactive. Did you know that? How many people knew that? Oh my gosh, you all rot. Well, see, no, there you go. He learns. So in this case, since they pick up potassium and uranium is somewhat similar, they kind of get it naturally. And my gosh, a banana is 0.1 microsievert. What does that mean? First off, does that mean I stop eating bananas? No. So long as you get them from a reputable source, your bananas are safe, they're happy, they're nutritious, they taste good, and they're only one ten millionth of a sievert. If you're saying how dangerous is a sievert, well, one, one sievert is pretty much lethal, okay? So, and we don't have to worry about that in our lifetime. But you're like, well, exactly how radioactive is a banana as compared to just me walking around? Us being in this room, 
we pick up between one and two bananas or 0.1, 0.2 microsieverts per hour. So just being in this room, we were actually taking in some ambient radiation, okay? So you're safe. If you're like me, and you're the kind of person that does not like mixers, how many are introverts? Raise your hand. Oh, well, we have some honest people. So if you're looking for a unique way to get out of going to a party, say, well, every person that you're sitting next to is mildly radioactive themselves. So they are exactly 0.05 microsievert or about a half a banana's worth of radiation. So you can just say, somebody says, hey, can you come to this mixer? And we're going to put you among the people that you don't know, and you're going to talk about topics you have no idea about. You can say, well, I'm afraid I might pick up maybe 1.5 extra sieverts, mi uh, uh, microsieverts an hour. I don't feel comfortable. OK, that joke bobbed. I apologize. I tried. Just to just give us a, a few more reference points. If you go to the dentist and you get an x-ray, that is five microsieverts. And so how many bananas is that? Uh, looks like 50. An airplane flight from New York to Los Angeles, because you're up in the air, not protected by as much atmosphere. It's 40 microsieverts. It's about 400 bananas. And a full body CT scan is 10 millisieverts, so we've changed our, our degree of measurements there, which is 10,000 bananas. And lastly, the EPA recommended limit, yearly limit for US radiation workers is 50 millisieverts, which is 50,000 bananas a year. So there's some reference points when we're talking about what a banana is, what a sievert is, et cetera. And, well, you shouldn't worry about it at all. Yes, exactly. As far as I know, none of us here are uh, radiation workers. I mean, if you are, then, you know, you already know that. <laughs> so I started a little project after watching uh, Derek Muller's presentation. And I created the item on the right, which was uh, actually I started out with Arduino and I hooked it to a Geiger counter and I went, cool. And it was doing the clicking and I, I wrote a little uh, macro in it that would capture what's called counts per minute or CPM. I was really happy. And then a buddy of mine named Chris Schaefer said, I can make it smaller. And he did it with an 8266 processor right next to it. So the big thing there you see is actually the Geiger counter, which you can see right here. And then he created an 8266 processor, did, did the same thing, and I said, show off. So what do you do with a Geiger counter? Well, you walk around your house with it. And you say, is my house radioactive. And what I found is I drop it in each room and I leave it in there and then I would find out, okay, I'd get between one and two bananas an hour, right? 1.1 to 0.2 microsieverts an hour. And then I walked into my garage and it jumped up to about 30 microsieverts per hour. And I went, oh my gosh, my freezer is radioactive. Yes, that means, since I have a freezer in my garage, that means I, yes, am a redneck. Wait, you want to scale your not that I know of, but I'll let you know later. So I said, my gosh, what's going on? So I put the little pin in it so it'd make the little clicking sound so I could actually pick up, the, hear the particles as I hit. And I got to about 60, where we go, tick, 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 tick. And it was the Coleman lantern that my dad had and gave me. And I said, where did dad take this Coleman lantern? So I did a little bit of research. I said, where can the heck, why is a Coleman lantern radioactive? And the truth is, if you see those little white spongy things, those are called mantles. That is what the, the Coleman fuel would flow over. And those were made with part of those are made with thorium if you bought these things prior to 1985. They're actually radioactive. So if you have an old clock that glows in the dark for absolutely no reason, that's radium. If you have a lens that has a special coating on it from in the, that your parents gave you from the 1970s, um, some of them were made with thorium, so they were mildly radioactive. So since they were decaying, I actually called up uh, the uh, uh, refuse people and I said, how do I safely get rid of it? They said to handle it with plastic paint gloves, put it in a plastic bag and discard it. And I went, okay, I can do that. So I took this little device and I said, what else can I do with it? I'm done, right? And I said, you know, I started reading some more articles and they said, no, why stop there? And I said, well, I can send this data over to a cloud, do some processing, do all this stuff to it. And then it kind of hit me, I said, wait a minute, I can do some of this processing from the edge. I've got the, the second rendition after I got rid of Arduino. I've, I had an old Raspberry Pi, so I used uh, Pi4J, 
and I connected to it, I got the counts per minute, and then I said, you know what, how can I convert it to micro sieverts? I figured out how to do that after some research, and then I did another conversion into bananas, and I started seeing that I could do more with this, and what it came, the idea came from was some articles I was reading on what's called edge computing. We are starting to push more, if you will, more data or more processing to the edge because our processors are way more powerful out there. We have some people that are out there that are doing facial recognition, not by taking the picture, sending it to the cloud, they're actually doing it on the device at the edge. In my case, what I wanted to do was actually do some of the processing from the edge. I didn't want to send it all the way back. The other thing that it did is it said, look, the device doesn't have to send all the data back. You can create filters on this data in such a way that I don't have to send all this data back. So actually what that means is I don't have to send as much traffic. I'm sorry, I like this. Um, you'll never see, go get, this, uh, get to work on time. So, so is a, a good analogy of edge computing sort of like the, the traditional thick, thin client? In a way you could, that's right. And so in this demo, we are doing a little bit of both. We're gonna demo where we're doing a thin client, which we're gonna be called basic, uh, basic IoT using an 8266 processor. And then we're gonna have a thick client that's gonna be the um, uh, uh, Raspberry Pi that's gonna do more. So when we look at an edge device, by the way, if you have any questions, raise your hands. This is a question-driven uh, presentation. Um, if we start running out of time, I'll, I'll call it. So in this case, um, if we go back into the edge, what is an edge uh, uh, device made of? It's made up of four components. One is the bottom part. It's your sensor or your actuator. In my case, it was a Geiger counter. Then you have your uh, controller that's going to receive the data from the, a from the uh, sensor or our actuator. It's going to do the processing. In this case, I had a Spring Boot app do it. Yes, you can run Spring Boot on the edge. Then what you're going to do is the agent is going to in turn take that data the controller captured. In this case, again, it's the same Spring Boot app, and it's going to send over what we call a long haul, what it's going to do to push the data out. In this case, we did something very simple for this device. It's just hooking into Wi-Fi. So in this room, I actually have it running, and as part of the presentation at the end, we're going to show you some live data. So let's look at what, we, what streams that we would create to be able to handle these devices. Roy, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, again, to reiterate, we're talking about IoT devices versus edge devices. And IoT device and the, the thick client versus thin client con concept would be, the IoT device would be the, the uh, thin client, and the edge device would, again, be the thick client. In our case, an IoT device does not have a lot of computational power. Uh, it's gonna receive the, uh, the, the counts per minute data uh, from the controller, which is on the device, and it's not going to do any processing on that. It's not going to be able to cache it. It's not going to be able to resend it later. The expectation is that it's going to receive that data and just send it on. So our stream needs to be able to be designed to support that. It needs to, to support the processing of that data. It's going to expect the data to not be uh, modified or, or uh, uh, processed in any way. Yeah, it's just raw data. Well, raw data that's barely processed, just to CPM, just a little. Uh, once, it, once it's done receiving that data, because uh, again, that's all the, the, the hardware controller is going to do, it's going to send it off to the cloud. Uh, so this diagram shows uh, basically what we're going to need to do to design that stream. So here uh, we can see what a, a stream is going to look like. Uh, we've got an HTTP source on the far left, the, the blue. Um, so it's going to be receiving that data sent from the IoT device. And then we're going to pass that, that data is going to be passed along to a processor, which is that first green one. Uh, if you can't read that, it's called trans, uh, Transform CPM. Uh, in our case, uh, what that means is uh, we want to transform the data. We, we, we got this raw counts per minute. Uh, we want to know what that is in bananas, so we need to calculate that. We want to add a timestamp to it, maybe. Um, uh, what else do we want to? We want to convert to bananas and sieverts. There we go. Okay, sieverts, sorry. Uh, and then maybe we need to process it some more. Uh, so we, we added another processor to this pipeline, and that's the second green one. Uh, it says filter 
uh, out bad CPM or C yeah. dot dot dot. <laughs> Filter out bad CPM. Uh, in this case, uh, say we get a really weird reading like a million or minus 800. Uh, we know those are not accurate readings. So we're going to filter those out and not include them. And then lastly, we've got a uh, JDBC sync in this pipeline. And so we're, we want to store that uh, processed and filtered data into a JDBC sync or JDBC uh, database. So uh, that should be clear enough how we want to design this stream for the, the IoT device. Uh, now let's compare to what it, we want to do with a, an edge device. So for an edge device, remember, it's going to be more of our thick client. It's capable of processing more. Maybe it's capable of caching that data on device. Maybe it's capable of resending the data if it doesn't have a good signal. So our stream is going to be designed around, around those uh, ideas. So again, we're going to receive the counts per minute data from the controller. Uh, the device is going to then process the data. So our previous stream, the IoT stream, we were doing the processing in the IoT stream. In the case of the edge device, the device itself is going to process the data. And then it's going to send to the, to the cloud. Uh, and then we've got this uh, decision tree right here. Either it can reach the cloud or not. And if it can't reach the cloud, then it's going to uh, cache it to the file system and save it to, for attempting to write it later. Any questions on that? Clear so far? So the, the corresponding stream for receiving this information is a little uh, simpler in this case. You can see we've got one less processor. Um, same thing, we have an HTTP source and we're going to be reading that data from the device, be, being sent from the device. Um, we still have our filter out bad CPM. So uh, even if, uh, in this case, even if we, we receive some weird data from that edge device, we can, we're still gonna be filtering it out. And then we have a, the, the same JDBC sync at the end there in the, the pipeline. So it's gonna be storing the, the data in the database. Um, so we've just designed two different streams. And uh, if you wanna think about these and, and uh, HTTP senses, uh, the devices are basically making HTTP posts. And then we've got our streams that are receiving those HTTP posts, um, making, you know, receiving the web requests. Uh, but it looks like we have to have two different apps running here. And uh, Glenn, is there a better way that we can do this? Is, is there something that- I think so. Well, there's a couple of things that we want to talk about. So we saw before, yes, sir, go ahead. Yes, I can. In this case, it was for demonstration purposes because I wanted to show a combined flow. But to your point, could I have actually done the filtering out on the, on the uh, there's two reasons I chose to do it. One was there's some examples I'm going to have later on that I want to kind of build onto. But in this, the other case was, is I couldn't necessarily always trust the data that I'm receiving from the HTTP port. It may be from a faulty device, and that faulty device may be sending some bad data. I could have filtered it over there, but in this case, I wanted to make sure that the data that was getting into the database was as clean as possible, okay? Um, again, it, it's one of those cases where um, I took and I built two copies of this device, and I, I put one in my mom's house, I put one in my house, and walked them around. And the only time I ever got erroneous data was, and it was kind of the inspiration behind it, is the tube in here got loose. And when the tube got loose, I got some spurious, like 100 CPM, which is like, you know, raise a red flag, there might be a problem in your house, like a radium issue or whatever um, that you want to contact somebody about. And I was like, what's going on? And it was like just a loose tube. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, in this case, let me filter some of that out. Now, I set the bar a little high. We'll talk about that later. That's a great question, though. Yeah. Um, I think a third reason mm -hmm. I designing this. Yeah. And there were like actual IoT devices collecting all this data. I probably designed it this way as well just because I can patch the filtering. Good point. Mm -hmm. Dealing with an edge device architecture, you've even you've even set it up so if I can't reach the cloud outlet, you can be stored. Then I can store locally, which tells me. I, I can't update the software on that device easily either because I have to be able to reach it and patch it. Yeah. Exactly. So typically, you want IoT devices to be done, I think. 
And, and that's the two thoughts. One is you can do an IoT device that's pretty, like you said, pretty dumb, and all it does is send data. It's the question is, is what problem you're trying to solve to get that, why do I need to go to the edge? Do I need to push that out there? Do I have the hardware? Do I trust the hardware? One of the questions that you will be asked is, well, if you put, if I were like to take this device and put it into a slightly more radioactive location, can I actually trust the Raspberry Pi device itself in those conditions? Answer is probably no. So that's when it, this goes into, this is Glenn playing, but when you're building your app, you've got to make sure it's shielded properly in this case. Um, that the, only the IoT or the, the Kyger counter is actually exposed to the elements while the actual, if you're doing Arduino or you're going to do an 8266 or in my case the Raspberry Pi is shielded from those types of things. Yeah, and we can carry the analogy to, you know, mobile applications like Android, uh, iOS applications. You know, if you push out an Android and iOS application and it's got a bug in it, well, you got to fix the bug and then you got to submit the new application to Apple or whatever before you can get that out there. Well, it, compare that to like a mobile website where you can just update the website and then everybody who's using it would be able to do uh, to, to receive the updated bug fix. So it, it's again, it, it kind of goes back to that thin client versus thick client. Um, if you want to reduce some of the, the chattiness between uh, the device and, and your server, then you'd want to put some of the, the processing maybe on the device so that uh, it, it's already handling some of the heavy lifting for you. Uh, if, if the communication's uh, less of a concern, then you, you can definitely uh, offload that to the server. Um, same, same sort of concerns that we have with other applications as well. So, um, by the way, great questions, thank you. Um, so the thing that we're going to be looking at with this is that we, the one thing that, so if we're running two streams that are very similar, one is going to be, both are going to be filtering, both are going to have the JDBC sync. In this case, if we look at this a little bit sharper, what we can see is that I can actually combine those two together. So the one, the one thing we want to talk about before we go into... So you're meaning we, before we had designed two different applications and now we're... We had two different streams okay. deployed. Okay. Now we've got and the one thing that we want to make sure is once we receive the data, we want to make sure that data is stored. So we want to have a messaging framework that we store that data that hops. Once we receive the HTTP data, we want to make sure that data doesn't go anywhere. So we're going to have a messaging framework like Rabbit, like Kafka, like Kinesis, Google PubSub, something underlying that data so we don't lose it. Also, by doing this, we also can do some pretty interesting routing of that data, right? In this case, we're going to do something fairly simple. In the previous example, in order to do what we did, we had two JDBC syncs, two um, filters. In this case, we can kind of reduce those down because their roles are fairly light at this point. And with that being said, and you'll see at the lower right-hand side, we have what's called the alert sync, where if it, it, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. In this case, what we're going to do is we're going to capture that data. We want to send it through the, uh, in this case, we'll just go ahead and say Kafka. And what we're going to do is um, we're going to create a topic called store stream. And we're going to route both traffics through that topic. And then what we're, the, what's going to happen is, is the filter outbound or filter uh, out bad CPM is going to read that topic, process, filter that data out, and send it onto the JDBC sync. Now, with that being said, um, I've just taken something that are really basic functions, small Java apps, it could even be a, a Python app, whatever you want to do. In this case, we're using Java because I work for who? Spring. So everything's got to be a Spring Boot app, right? Y'all are going, okay, whatever. <laughs> but no, I'm serious. But in this case, um, I receive these, uh, this, this data, and what I want to be able to do is, is just worry about the function. So how many had a chance, uh, who uh, caught Mark Heckler's talk on Spring Cloud Stream? Okay, cool. So you already got a primer on this. For those that haven't, he's got some recordings on YouTube that cover it in more depth, but I'm going to give you a but, 101. But before we leave this slide, uh, just to reiterate one of those points the, about the question earlier, why are we doing the filtering and both of them and not pushing um, the filtering to the edge device? Well, it, in this case, it allows us to combine those streams into a single stream. So we've got both sources coming from both the IoT device and the edge device, and we are filtering on both of them. So instead of having to have two different streams, we're, we're filtering, uh, it, we can combine them. So in this case, the thing that we look at Spring Cloud Stream, and what Spring Cloud Stream does is it allows me to just focus on the function I have to write. The parameters that will go into the function are going to come from an inbound topic. 
the data that once it's processed and comes out of function is going to be right, written out to an uh, outbound topic. And Spring Cloud Stream can do that for me by doing nothing more than, in this case, adding a couple of annotations. You'll see them highlighted here. You'll see where the processor input will be, uh, the, uh, be anything that comes in from my input topic will be written to the sensor data string. Data, once it's uh, been filtered, or in this case filtered, is going to uh, send it out via the result of that function. And through Spring Cloud uh, Stream, all I have to do is add the Spring Cloud Stream starter, the Spring Cloud Stream binder, whatever I want, whether it's uh, Kafka, uh, again, Kafka, Rabbit, Kinesis, whatever. And that will be the binder that says, okay, I want to put these two together. And then at the time I deploy the app, I can say, the inbound topic is named this, an outbound topic is named that, and then Spring Cloud Stream will do all that negotiation. So by adding just a couple of annotations to my code, I don't have to do that, that uh, hook into that messaging framework. I guess before we go further from here, it, it's important to point out, this is the entirety of the application. So this is a Spring Boot application. You have this, uh, f excuse me, filter CPM application. So it's one of those components of that stream that we showed earlier. It's, you add a couple of these annotations and then all of a sudden you have a fully working uh, processor, which is the, that green piece right there. So it's, a, it's an encapsulated Spring Boot application. You add a few of those annotations and it just handles the inputs and outputs for you. So the other thing that we want to make sure is that if you lose the latest Spring Cloud uh, stream, you don't have to annotate it. You just add Spring Cloud function, and so long as this is the only function you have in there, it will do all the connections for you. So you just wrote in a pure uh, Java function. You're done. Yeah? Um, working, I've worked with similar frameworks like this, right? Mm -hmm. Where I'm consuming events from a Kafka stream uh, in an event sourcing, kind yeah. of right? Mm -hmm. So I'm consuming events, and then I'm maybe publishing to a different topic. Right. Like, much like what we have here, right? But in a lot of those frameworks, you end up with uh, the ability to horizontally scale. So I, I would take a block of code like this and have it be attached to five workers, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Is there, is there that capability here? Yes, you can. Now, Spring Cloud uh, Stream doesn't do that personally itself, but what you can, well, I mean, I'll, I'll say it this way. I would deploy five apps, and then what you can do is you can have a group, and then you can send that data to the group, and it can, you can have it as a round robin, or you can have it as a router and route to the correct one, just in case you're doing some kind of, um, you know, uh, a specialized sending to those, so you can do all that through Spring Cloud Stream. Yes. Apps on one JVM? Uh, no, to different JVMs. So if you want to, it could be the same. It would. Well, see again. It, we could talk about the scaling because you can scale it out any way you want. So I can actually have this method to be able to do that. There, Spring Cloud Stream has several properties that allow you to determine how you want to connect to Kafka specific or Rabbit specific. So we can talk about those. Yeah, I don't want to touch that. No, no, but, but that's a good question. And it, it answers, yes, you can. And I'm, I'm thinking more at it right now as the app side. But you're thinking about is more of being able to spin up threads maybe? Or? I, I, want to make, I want to be able to leverage my cores, right? Uh, absolutely. You could set the leverage up your cores. And then what you would do is you would have to make this a, more of a React. So the other thing you can do is reactive streams. So Spring Cloud Stream offers reactive streams. So you can actually write this as a reactive function. And you can handle in flux or, or uh, monos and be able to process them that way. Yeah, that's probably more what you're looking for. By the way, it takes me a little while to get to the right answer. I have to hem and haul to figure it out. Yes, sir. No, this is just a basic, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I tell you what, uh, if you get a chance, Mark Heckler's talk goes into, and he talks, he does it like empirically like I did here because I'm, I'm, I'm just now getting to reactive myself. He's been in reactive for a while, but he talks about the empirical, then he goes into more of the reactive coding. That's it. That, well, that's the way it's going to be. It's going to flux in, flux out, or, you know, you could do, do a flux in, do some, you know, get it down to a mono, return a mono if you wanted to, but yeah. Uh, yeah, and, th and this talk uh, was really designed to be more of an introduction to some of these concepts, so we, we didn't get into Yeah, because we got 10 minutes that, but, left. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, we wanted to cover, we, we talked about Spring called Stream, uh, what you can accomplish with that. Uh, but at this point, what, 
what do we offer that helps you orchestrate these things a little bit e more easily? Um, let's see. So uh, we want to introduce Spring Cloud Dataflow. How many, how many people have heard of it? Spring Cloud Dataflow? Yep. How I many wish you have never heard of it? <laughs> hey! I saw that. <laughs> Until now, I've never heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was going to say, if you wish you never heard of it. <laughs> um, so Spring Cloud Dataflow is a toolkit for building data integration, real-time streaming, and batch data processing and pipelines. So we've talked about streams here, uh, but there's another component that Spring Cloud Dataflow will help you orchestrate, and that's called Spring Cloud Task. Um, you can think about... Uh, Spring Batch. I'm jumping ahead of myself a little bit here, but uh, yeah. So uh, Spring Cloud Stream is gonna be long-running processes where you're expecting the data to be continuing to, to come into those, those streams uh, for you know, indefinite period of time. Whereas a Spring Cloud task, consider, consider that to be an ephemeral application that's gonna have a start time and an end time. It's uh, gonna be something that you schedule, typically like a batch operation. Spring Cloud Dataflow helps you orchestrate and uh, design, organize uh, the, these, both of these, uh, Spring Cloud Stream and Spring Cloud Task. Uh, out of the box, we have over 60 data integration apps which you can use with Spring Cloud Dataflow. Um, if you go back, if you think back to our previous slide where we had the, the uh, HTTP source, the JDBC sync, those two are out of the box applications that Spring Cloud Dataflow provides, meaning that you can just drop them into an application, utilize their capabilities, you don't have to write those yourself. And Spring Cloud Dataflow offers over 60 of those. Uh, it also offers a, a DSL, a GUI, and REST APIs. So depending on how you need to interface with Spring Cloud Dataflow, you can do it with a web UI. Uh, it's, it's a very robust UI. It shows you everything uh, you need to know. Uh, we're going to demo that in just a minute. Uh, if you wanted to interact with Dataflow via your CI system or something, the, you could use the REST APIs and make a HTTP requests to those. Uh, and then, of course, a, a DSL for integrating with your applications. Uh, and I mentioned that uh, Spring Cloud tasks are ephemeral, so uh, it supports cron job scheduling, and that's how it, it basically manages starting and stopping those uh, Spring Cloud tasks. Um, any questions on uh, sort of the overview of Dataflow? All right, well, I'll tell you what. So we're going to begin the speed ringing portion of this presentation. So in this case, the first thing we did is you saw where we created that filter, and if you go out to my project, you'll see where we have the, or our project, you see where we have the filter, the transformer, and those are things that I wrote. So we have to tell Dataflow that I want to be able to say, I want to use this Docker image, this Maven image for my project. Uh, so I want to use it in my stream. So in this case, I'm calling it uh, filter out uh, bad CPM. That's going to be the name I'm assigning to it. I give it my Docker location. Now Dataflow knows I can actually use that. So you registered the app. I registered the app, and it's going to pull the Docker in and push. So in this case, all the samples you're about to see here are actually coming from, or I'm deploying to Kubernetes. So in this case, what I'm going to do is now that we've registered all our apps, I've registered everything so it would save time, I'm going to create my first stream. And it's going to be the stream that I'm going to be writing the data out to. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a topic. And Dataflow will dynamically create this topic for me. And it's called store stream. I didn't have to create it. It will create it for me. But if it's already been pre-created, Dataflow will say, oh, you already have this topic. I don't have to create it. I'll just use it. And I'm going to, in turn, send that data that, uh, from that. I'm going to, or sorry, my filter outbound CPM is going to read data from that topic. And then it's going to create another uh, topic between it and the JDBC, the filter and JDBC. And once it creates that, or I should say it creates it at deployment time, um, we create the stream, we called it uh, store stream, or sorry, store data. And now I'm going to go in and deploy that store data stream to Kubernetes. So all, what I did was I created the stream definition and then I said deploy it to Kubernetes. I can also, from, this, from the same, um, UI, I can do it to Cloud Foundry, local, or any instance of Kubernetes that's out there. So I can deploy to multiple uh, Kubernetes clusters if I wanted to. So now I want to be able to create this stream that's going to be receiving the data from my IoT device. And remember, it's got to do that transform. So in this case, what we're going to do is go ahead and create another stream. 
And, this, and what we're going to do again is going to drag out the HTTP um, source. I'm going to drag over the uh, transformation that I have. Uh oh, they're done. And then what we're going to do is then send that data over to our store stream. And I'm going to write that to port 9001 and have data flow. And again, I'm just doing my stream description right here. I'm going to write that data to the store stream topic. I'm going to uh, create that stream, give it a name. And we're going to call it the IoT uh, input. And now that that has been created, I'm going to uh, create that stream. Now the stream definition is created. Now I want to deploy that to my Kubernetes. And we'll do that. So now we're going to wait for that to complete. Or we don't have to wait for that to complete. It's just going to go do it. And now we're going to repeat that same step for my edge device. Remember, it doesn't have to do as much. I'm going to skip past that demo. And then we're going to actually see the data live. OK? So now that the, so once I deploy those out to Kubernetes, they're receiving live data. This was at a local Starbucks, which was mildly radioactive more than anywhere else. I know it's hard to see. And I apologize, I'll try to zoom this in later. I didn't see it, notice it till today. And this is a sexy interface called Squirrel, if you've ever seen it before. And in this case, you're going to see the data that's flowing in. I, is the device only sends data about once a minute, so I've sped this up. And we can see that um, from the device I had there, I was getting between 1.4 and 1.9 bananas a minute. And so we can then say, I, to simulate it and tickle it a little bit more, I wanted to I send in data through the IoT. I, I forgot to bring the IoT device with me that day. And I just did a curl command and sent in 60, which you'll see come in in a second. And I hit a refresh, and you'll see it magically appear. And some more data came in. And then lastly, we'll see that it actually had a different device name. The last thing I want to do here and this is I want to be able to, we've created our basic flow, but now I want to create, an, create a tap. How many read the Enterprise Integration Patterns book, the big, thick black book? Oh my gosh, brave people, I love you. I did too. Uh, it was a cover to cover. I only read most of it, but sometimes I went to sleep. It was great bedtime reading, but valuable bedtime reading. In this, create, in this case, I'm creating a tap. And what it means is at the end of the filter, I want to get that data as soon as it's filtered and I want to get a copy of that data, and if that data has more than eight bananas of radiation, I want to send a message to my Slack channel that says there's a problem. And in this case, I'm actually going to go through the recording. I know we're running out of time. Thank you for your patience. But I think it's important to see this real quick. In this case, again, I'm going to go to this stream called stream data. I'm going to that stream, and I'm going to say I want to tap that filter outbound data or output uh, filter out bad CPM. I want to capture that data at that point, and I want to send it to my alert sync, which goes in, kind of does a little bit of filtering. It receives a message and says, ah, it's more than eight bananas. Go ahead and send out that alert. I created a definition right there. Now I'm going to deploy it. There you go. It is now deploying. And then we go in and we see that, you can see I sent in some really bad data earlier in the day, but again, in this case, I forced it to send in some data where I said, okay, I want to send in um, about uh, uh, what we'll call 100 CPM, and I simulated this because you don't want to be in place. Well, it's not bad, but it's not a good place to be at 100 CPM, which gives you about eight bananas of radiation. And uh, we've got, we're actually one minute over. I'm going to skip the task side. No, we have to 150. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to go ahead and skip that. And do you want to go ahead and give us a live demo? Yeah, definitely. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to just reiterate really quickly. Um, so Glenn's uh, recorded demo was on Kubernetes, and he was showing you how Dataflow can deploy applications to, to Kubernetes. Uh, this is an example uh, where it's deployed to Cloud. Oh, did I brush this too much? I think you're right. We have till two. I'm sorry. Sorry. He was right. I was wrong. I stand ashamed. I was pushing this too fast. You will get out of here early. Yay. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, 
So uh, what you can see here, th this is on Cloud Foundry. We, we've got a lot of different apps running. These are all of the individual pieces in those streams that we've defined. So each of those pieces, the HTTP source, the JDBC sync, the, uh, the processors, they're deployed as separate applications within your cloud environment, whether it's Kubernetes or Cloud Foundry. And it, it's really easy to see on the screen because it, you, you can see all of those various applications running. Um, so I can also show you the, uh, the Dataflow server itself. Um, we can go see the, the same dashboard. And so you can see that it's the, the exact same data flow. Network, network, network. Yay. Yep. Um, yeah. So we've got our deployed streams. Uh, one difference that uh, is worth mentioning, uh, Glenn deployed a uh, Docker container yep. for his uh, processors, his, his custom stream components. Uh, whereas with the version that I've got running here on Cloud Foundry, I'm actually uh, pulling those from an HTTP source. So I've deployed the jars out to GitHub and I can just pull the raw uh, jar off of there. And, and Dataflow supports both of those deployments. Well, HTTP, Maven, Docker, yep. file. Whatever you have to, your data, your jars are stored. Yeah, in fact, the, the built-in applications, the over 60 applications that Dataflow provides, those are all available in Maven Central. And, and Docker. And, yep. and, and Docker Hub. Yep. Um, so, let's see. Uh, I can start watching my logs, and you said you wanted to send some real data. Oh, I'm sending it now. Yeah, you got about another 20 seconds before you get something. Why did, wait a minute, did you just tap off of my stream? I did. So Why did you tap off my stream, my beautiful stream? You put more stuff on it. How dare you? All right, from what uh, Glenn demoed, and that's that I, uh, I've got this um, log sync that I just uh, threw onto the, the store stream because I wanted to log every bit of data that was coming in off of this stream. So if I go back over here, I can see, and there it is. So this is coming from the edge device, or excuse me, it's not coming from the edge device. It's already been processed. So we it is we, from the edge device. Uh, okay. Yep. Yeah, you're you're getting from the edge right there. That's the edge. It's this kind of close edge. That's really there. Uh, you can see that it's it's converted everything to the, the microsieverts. Uh, we've got the how many bananas did we get? That's one big question. We only got about not even get a full banana. That's a little bit more than. Uh, no, we're going to have more bananas than that. I'm sabotaging you, buddy. I'm just going to sabotage you right now. You got 200 bananas or 200 count. How many bananas is that? You said that's 16 bananas. I gave you 16 bananas of radiation because I wanted to sabotage your talk. Yeah, let's not do that again. I need to survive the early return. Yep. <laughs> uh, okay, what else did, did we want to do? Oh, well, let's show them the, the alert. Did it get an alert? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. 200 bananas of eat. Yeah. I've got a Slack channel. Oh, uh, I sent you two. Dang it. You sent me too. So there we go. We've got um, data coming into the Slack channel. So we've got various taps off of this stream. We've got things logged. We've got things going into a database. Uh, all of this is just defined in the pipeline. Uh, you can see uh, easily from previously, you can see how you can graphically design those. Um, uh, it, Glenn also showed, I, I don't know if you could see, but at the top, it, there's a, a, a a language that you can use to kind of define this stuff without using the graphical uh, interface. Um, That's right. Let's see. Uh, I wanted to, yep. So, so one thing that we hadn't talked about yet is Spring Call Dataflow also has a shell. Um, so if you don't want to use the web interface, you can uh, use this as shell. And uh, really this illustrates that both the shell and the web interface are making all the same RESTful API calls to the REST interface of Spring Cloud Dataflow. Um, so they're, they're all exercising those same endpoints. Um, I can do something like um, app list here, and that's going to show me all my apps. I can do... Um, those are all the apps we registered from both Dataflow and the ones we register ourselves. Yep. Uh, let's do a stream see. list. You can see uh, log banana average. That's, that's a, uh, a task. Uh, so do you want to talk about tasks real quick? That we added. 
I'm just going to list the streams. Uh, yep, I'm going to let you do that. Okay. Um, there we go. All right. So I'll tell you what, I'm going to go since I have extra two minutes and then we'll start taking questions. One of the things that we skipped really quick was the concept of tasks. So how many of you have actually used Spring Batch before and not in shame? So I mean, nobody knows what Spring Batch is. Spring Batch is basically an, is basically an ability for you to do uh, to create a simple boot application that will go in. I say simple to read in data, process data at, at large scale, and then write that data out. So basically, anytime you think of a batch app, it simplifies your ability to create batch applications. But one of the things that we're starting to see is that people don't just run a single batch application out there. They want to run them. Uh, several batch applications in a row and they want them to run in sequence where batch app where I might be going in and saying I want to process invoices. Now if I process invoices and that's complete I want to process uh, the billing and I don't want to process billing until after process invoices and we call that workflow or what you would be also referred to as a composed task and the workflow says that once A is done in this case the invoicing I want to write that data out via uh, I want to go ahead and take that data that I've just wrote up the invoices for and write that data out as a, and go ahead and write the bills. In our case, what that does is you can create a, a workflow in Spring Cloud, Spring, or Spring, and sorry, Spring Cloud Dataflow. In this case, I just did a single app. It was a single workflow where it goes in and runs a log and gets the average of uh, the uh, bananas that we uh, have in our database. In this case, I'm just going to create a workflow of one um, again, this is just going to go in and run a Spring Batch app that's going to read all the data from the database that we've been storing that data into. And I've already registered the app, and it's called Log Average um, uh, Bananas. I'm going to go ahead and give that uh, workflow a name, and it's called uh, Logging Average, I believe. I can't even see it myself, Average Bananas. And then I would launch it. Now, once that is launched, I can go in and check the execution to make sure that it actually executed successfully. I can hit refresh, and then from there, go in and click the execution to see that it actually launched. And then I can scroll down. In this case, I just logged it to a uh, uh, to the, my console or to the log. I wrote out a log. In this case, Dataflow allows me to view the logs from my Kubernetes pod, and I can go out and click the pod and re-verify that that's what the data was actually that it was actually there. So Dataflow allows me to compose or orchestrate these tasks, but also allows me to create, um, or say, sorry, it allows me to orchestrate these streams, and I can uh, update these streams, add to these streams, and then uh, as far as tasks are concerned, I can create workflows with those. So the power that I get from an IoT or edge computing is that I can create these streams as I add and change my uh, IoT infrastructure to the streams, uh, that my streams can keep up with that and maybe add on and add additional value to it. Okay, so uh, that pretty much wraps up the talk. Uh, there is the GitHub repo again. If you'd like to check out all of that code, everything is up on there. Um, let Even you see. the sensor app that we use to capture the information. Yep, yep. Is uh, there any questions that you Any have? questions, yep. Okay, thanks right, everybody thanks for so coming. Much. Enjoy the rest of the conference.